Hello hackers, welcome to another video in the Phone College Memory Error Module. I'm Jan, today we're talking about stack canaries. So we're rolling into the mitigations against memory corruption vulnerabilities. Um, and stack canaries is the first one we'll talk about. Um, I say canaries, right? Um, stack canaries are very much named after an actual canary or, or uh, the, the concept of canaries in a gold mine. Back in um, the olden days, before um, advanced technology that could detect gases and po poisonous gases in the air, uh, miners would bring a canary with them to uh, into the mine because canaries are um, more um, susceptible to poison gases. And if they saw that their canary was dead all of a sudden, then they need to get out of the mine because likely they would be next. All right, so that's kind of the concept of a canary. And um, in 1998, this concept was developed for um, uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities. Specifically, the idea was that using a digital canary that would get killed before anything else bad happened, you could protect the stack. Um, this concept was uh, created by a group of researchers from um, the Oregon Graduate Institute of Science and Technology and published in uh, 1998 at Usenix Security, still one of the um, top cybersecurity uh, venues for academic work. Um, to this day, and it was created um, by um, a group of people that went on to found Immunix, which is a which was a company that um, built these sort of uh, very hardened um, Linux systems uh, that utilized stuff like StackGuard, and um, uh, later on they went on to invent, for example, AppArmor, which is used to this day along with StackGuard, of course, but AppArmor is specifically used to protect, for example, um, Docker containers and so on. So very uh, impactful uh, group of people. Um, they also, in a topic uh, near and dear to my heart, um, competed in DEF CON CTF in the year uh, 2003. I probably talked about DEF CON CTF in this course. It's um, essentially a kind of an Olympic of, of uh, hacking. Uh, the top groups from all over the world come and, and, and um, try to hack each other. And one year in 2003, in Unix, um, Linux, the company founded by these uh, researchers was among them. Um, uh, this uh, screenshot was taken on Saturday when they were in the lead. This is DEF CON 11 in 2003, uh, 17 years ago as we're recording this. Um, and uh, I believe that year Team Anomaly ended up winning. So something um, radical happened between Saturday and Sunday when the competition ends um, and the Munich lost their lead. Um, this is also the first year where um, teams from uh, uh, hackers from my uh, graduate institution alma mater, uh, my um, where I did my graduate work, UC Santa Barbara, um, competed under this name WMD. And I think two years later, they would, two years or four years later, they would go on to win. Um, I'm a little discombobulated right now, but it's a kind of a, a snapshot in history. And then these um, competitive hackers were creating technology that we'll talk about today that is still used to protect the stack against memory errors. All right, so what are stack canaries? Stack canaries are, are pretty simple. Um, stack canaries are targeted to protect against buffer overflows. The buffer overflows that we've been uh, looking at so far in this uh, module, buffer overflows, which are overflows on the stack um, and overflow the, uh, the return address or, or other um, variables or um, something along these lines. How does a canary work? Um, it's fairly straightforward and a function prolog, you take a random value and you write it um, to the end of the stack frame right before, um, right after either all of the buffers as you can identify them to the right of them 
or right to the left of the, the return address and saved uh, base pointer. And then the function epilog, you make sure that this value is still intact. If the canary has been killed, if an overflow clobbered it, um, then you simply kill the whole program. Now, the interesting thing is the canary value is random. So an attacker overflowing the entire buffer won't know uh, what the value of the canary is. Otherwise, they could overflow it with the exact same value and not change it. But they don't know that value, so they have to overflow it with something leading to a crash. Um, let me show you rather than keep babbling. Um, oops, that's looking ahead a little. So um, we have our buffer overflow. Um, that's the example from previous um, uh, video. This is as simple an overflow as you can get. There's a small buffer and a big read. All right, um, let's compile it. Before we compile it with this dash F no stack protector option. Now the gloves are off. Let's have the stack protector. Um, here we compiled it. Um, there's a utility called CheckSec that I've used several times um, on video CheckSec. Oh, gosh, CheckSec, if you use it properly, um, will check the security properties of a file and, and um, tell you what they are. And here you can see now this stack canary, this file has stack canaries. Stack canaries have been found. Let's take a look at what this means. Um, so let's uh, disassemble it and scroll up and look at the main function. All right, um, the main function has a couple of additions. One that you can kind of see right away is right at the end here is this stack check fail. And what happens is um, we read uh, from a place on the buffer right before uh, to the uh, uh, oh, sorry a place on the stack frame at the very right hand side of the stack frame immediately to the left of the saved um, uh, of where the frame pointer is pointing to which is where the saved frame pointer of the caller function um, is uh, has been written to um, we read a value that's there into RCX XOR it against a value stored globally in memory. This is a, an, a, a bit of an archaic way to um, access memory using what was called segmentation. Uh, it's a whole history lesson, but basically this is somewhere in memory in a, in a secret spot indexed by this um, uh, FS register that, that can't actually be accessed directly. You can only use it uh, for memory lookup. So it's great for this, um, uh, to hide this canary value. Anyways, at um, w whatever memory is pointed to by this FS register plus hex 28, there's a secret canary value. It's XORed with RCX. And if they're equal, um, then the... Uh, um, um, then the execution goes to main plus 5A. Uh which is this 1203, which is the normal epilogue. If they're not equal, we fall through to this stack check fail. Let me show you what this looks like. This is an overflow, boom, this is stack check fail. So stack smashing detected, terminates the program. So where did this value come from? This value was written over here in the extended prologue um, with the stack canary, it came from RAX. Um, RAX came from originally the same secret location. Um, pretty straightforward. Basically, the program uh, starts up. There's a secret location that's initialized with a random value. Um, that random value is um, moved to the stack. Then if it is then overflowed on the stack, then um, the random value, uh, um, then the check for that value will fail and um, we will abort execution. Let's take a look in GDB real quick. Okay, um, let's uh, break in main, run. 
Um, okay, here's the next five instructions. So let's step forward. Okay, so here we're about to um, read from this uh, secret location to Rx. So here's Rx right now, some address that was in there. Here is what it is now. Um, note the stack canary is a bunch of stuff ending in zero, zero. Of course, this is little endian, so it actually starts with a null byte. This becomes important uh, in the future. Um, and then, of course, here is where it got written to the stack. Let's take a look at the stack. Um, so here's what's on the stack right now, a bunch of, of messy data, and here's our canary. Uh, a while uh, fairly deep in the stack. Um, if we just keep going, eventually we do this read. And then when we overflow that canary with a bunch of A's, let's take a look at our stack again. It's all A's. The canary is gone. It was right here. If we scroll up, it was right there. And now it is gone. Let's keep going. Um, here we move um, that the value of, uh, out of the stack where the canary sh should be intact into RCX. Here's RCX now. That's bad news. That should be the canary, right? But we overflowed it. And we XOR RCX from this uh, secret location. And that is very much not zero. It would have been zero if it was equal, of course. And now jump equals course checks for the zero flag. The zero flag is not set. So we call stack check fail and we abort out of the program after printing this error message. That is how um, a uh, stack canary works. Um, super interesting stuff. Okay, so um, are stack canaries effective? Um, it turns out that yes, stack canaries are extremely effective. Um, one sec, let me fix this slide real quick. All right, there we go. That's better now you can read the whole um, slide. So as I mentioned, um, stack canaries are very effective. Um, there are certain mitigations that to bypass them you you really require an entire additional vulnerability or to get extremely lucky. Um, stack canaries are such a mitigation. To bypass a stack canary, you either need to straight up leak it with another vulnerability. That's definitely not easy. That requires an entirely additional vulnerability. Uh, maybe you can use the same vulnerability that you use to do the overwrite um, in a slightly different way to do the read, but it's... Um, very situational. Um, in certain cases, you can brute force a canary. Um, if you have a forking process, many, many, many network services are forking processes. And interestingly enough, um, every process on your phone, if you have an Android phone, forks off of one parent process. The canary is only initialized, that secret value uh, memory region is initialized with random data only at startup. Um, of the process. It is not re-randomized um, on every function execution or anything like that. Just at every um, startup time of the process, it's randomized. So if you have an Android phone and every process forks off of a parent process on an Android phone, that parent process is called the zygote, every single canary in every single process on your phone is um, the same. If you leak one, you know them all. But that's uh, kind of a unique situation. Um, I'm going to very quickly jump in um, and show you how a network forking service works. Of course, this service isn't a network um, forking service. I implemented it in this forker.c. And forker has a buffer um, and it'll continuously fork if it's the parent child, it'll wait on the child process. If it's the child, it will read way too much into the buffer and overflow itself. And we're gonna compile this with canaries. Uh, gloves are off. Okay, Forker uh, is compiled. Um, and we're going to run it and show um, 
how we can actually use the fact that the parent forks a child off, which means the child is an independent process. If it dies, no problem. The parent will just spawn a new one. Um, and we're going to show in um, Pwn Tools, of course, how we can, uh, sorry, that's looking ahead, how we can we can mess with it. So Pwn Debug, uh, Pwn that, de that GDB that debug um, opens up uh, our process in GDB, of course. Um, this is so that we can uh, break at main, not at mean. Continue. Here we are at main. Um, I just want to get the value of that canary. Um, so here we're about to move, read into our AX. Here we are writing it into our BP minus OX8. Here's the canary value. Um, let's do one thing. Let's. Um, this is it in little endian. This is it in big endian. So it starts at the first byte is a zero, 52, ed, and so on. Let me show you what happens. Because the child forks, um, we can continually interact with it. We can, of course, if we do r dot write and we write an a byte 128 times. And then we do r dot read and print that. Oh, hold on, I need to continue here. Then we see stack smashing detected terminating. So 128, of course, smashes the stack. The nice thing is we can do this repeatedly because the process continually forks. The parent is spinning up new children to handle um, our our input. Um, so now we can start messing with this. So let's say, okay, what is, is 16 too, too much? No, we haven't overwritten the canary yet. What about 32? Yes, we overwrote the canary. We do a binary search. What about hex 18? This is, um, 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 my mind just went blank. 24 bytes? Oh, still not. So probably the canary is eight bytes, is the eight bytes after this. So let's say A. Just an A byte here. Boom, we broke the canary, overrode it, bad news. What about if we do B, still bad news, but we know, we know what the first byte of the canary is, right? The first byte of the canary is a zero, this byte right here. If we write a zero into it, golden, because the canary's value didn't change. The canary check doesn't check if the canary was overwritten. It actually checks, has the canary been changed? If it was overwritten with the same value, it's a perfectly happy check. And we can use this to gradually brute force value after value. And start with one, nope, two, nope. I'm gonna cheat, but I don't have to cheat. I could count all the way up to hex 52. We got another one. What about the third byte? Not one, not two. Let's take a random guess, EB. Nope, I, I misremembered, ED. Yes. The amazing thing is in a forking process, this doesn't just apply to the canary, it's any data. I can leak out byte by byte the entire state of the stack before the fork occurred because I can keep querying the same uh, children of the same process over and over and over. Um, very cool stuff. There's another um, way that's also very situational that you can um, uh, bypass a canary. If your stack is laid out just right and modern compilers will intentionally lay out the stack in a secure way, of course, but for an attacker the wrong way. Um, but if the stack is laid out just right, for example, because uh, it is uh, a data structure that 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 um, happens to be like this, um, and you have a counter on the stack that your buffer overflows into. So this program will count from zero to one twenty eight and read at that offset into the buffer one byte at a time. This uh, happens. This happens especially when copying data more than when reading. Um, it is just a minimized version. Um, at some point, as you overflow this buffer, you'll start writing into the I counter. 
once you start writing to die counter, you can directly change where you're writing. And you can jump to write beyond the canary at the return value, for example. This, you need to get very lucky. Um, generally speaking, uh, luck does not favor us this much, but there are ways to get around the canary. They're just either situational or you require uh, a new vulnerability to leak it out. And in later videos, we will actually look into what that new vulnerability might, or what such vulnerabilities might look like. See you then.